We will now start the Jerry lecture, and uh, please welcome Larry Sherman. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. The National Council on Crime Prevention here in Sweden established the Jerry Lee Lecture as part of the annual symposium uh, program uh, in honor of the original donor to the prize, Jerry Lee, who is with us here today and who uh, worked very closely with uh, someone who was introduced last night at the ceremony, the current uh, police commissioner and former state secretary of justice, um, uh, Dan Eliasson, who uh, was the uh, first official uh, to proceed with the idea of developing uh, the prize in the symposium. Uh, and all of that uh, required uh, a, a very complicated uh, set of maneuvering in which many people played uh, a key role, but uh, in which the role of, uh, of Jerry Lee and the Jerry Lee Foundation was absolutely uh, essential. And because one of the high priorities of the Jerry Lee Foundation is uh, the uh, promotion of a uh, far too rarely used uh, research method, uh, which gives much more precise estimates about the costs, benefits, and other consequences of various programs, including how difficult they are to implement, um, we uh, are able to say that the, the focus of the Jerry Lee Lecture is always on uh, issues associated with uh, randomized controlled uh, trials, a wide range of issues uh, from uh, the way in which they may contribute to theory, uh, to uh, the theory of how best to use randomized trials in relation to policy uh, development. But I think it's particularly uh, felicitous when the Jerry Lee Lecture can also connect to the work of the prize winners, uh, which is exactly what we're going to hear uh, Professor Lorraine Mazarol do as soon as I tell you a few words about her. Uh, she is not only connected to the prize winners this year in relation to the subject matter uh, of her uh, presentation, but also uh, in relation to the fact that she was a student uh, at the Rector School of Criminal Justice when Ron Clark uh, was dean, and uh, she uh, had the opportunity to work with one of the um, leading experimental criminologists in the world, uh, David Weisberg, a former winner of the Stockholm Prize uh, in Criminology, uh, and uh, by working with him on uh, the Jersey City uh, drug uh, market uh, uh, intervention uh, trial, uh, she then moved on to uh, do trials of her own in, in Oakland and elsewhere, and uh, most uh, recently in a major test of uh, uh, procedural justice uh, in random breath tests uh, for alcohol uh, uh, levels uh, in, in Queensland. Um, her, uh, her influence as an experimental criminologist uh, has uh, been um, unexcelled. She has been uh, president of the Academy of Experimental uh, Criminology, uh, the Joan McCord Prize uh, winner uh, of, of that academy, and uh, her uh, reach and influence on experimental criminology in, in Australia, uh, as well as the United States, uh, is uh, continuing to promote the growth of knowledge in ways that can help uh, to uh, reduce crime and injustice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a uh, professor at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, Professor Lorraine Mazarol. for having me here today. Uh, it's a real honour. Thank you to Jerry, uh, Jerry Lee, for um, having this as a named lecture. Uh, the title of my talk today is The Ripple Effects of Police Experimentation, How One Trial Can Save the Lives of Many. So this is a picture of Robert F. Kennedy. The picture was taken on June 6, 1966, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. It was taken just after his Day of Affirmation speech, a speech that was sponsored by the National Union of South African Students, who, against all odds, were striving to uphold the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Kennedy came to South Africa to highlight freedom of speech and the role of government in shaping all aspects of a person's life, family life, 
work opportunities, access to education and safety. I came across his day of affirmation speech while I was preparing this lecture. I was particularly struck by Kennedy's comments about the ripple of hope. It's actually known as the ripple of hope speech. Quoting directly from his speech, he said the following. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centres of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Kennedy's depiction of how small actions can send forth tiny ripple of hope captures the theme of my lecture today. So the idea of a ripple effect is fundamental to crime prevention, which is, of course, a central theme of this year's symposium. So over the last few days, we've listened to a range of different presentations. Um, I think we all agree that one small change can indeed have enormous impacts on controlling and preventing crime across many different uh, situations, different places, and for different types of crime problems. So for the next 40 minutes, I think it's 40 minutes that you've asked me to speak, um, I'd like you to keep this imagery of a ripple effect in your mind. The ripple effect theme will throw, flow through each part of my lecture focusing on how one small change can have an enormous impact. And in the spirit of the Jerry, the Jerry Lee lecture, my emphasis today is on experimentation. I'll talk about how experimentation, with all its warts and flaws, often embodies the energy and daring that Kennedy described almost 50 years ago. So I'm going to start today's lecture by revisiting the lessons learned from Ron Clark and Derek Cornish's Kingswood Training School experiment that was published in 1975. I'll then consider the lessons from the Kingswood trial and how these lessons reverberate for police experimentation in 2015. I'll then introduce you to the Ability Truancy Trial, a recent policing experiment that my team and I have undertaken at the University of Queensland. I'll use these results from the Ability Study to focus on four ripple effects. The first ripple effect is where I look directly at the impact of the trial on truanting young people who are part of the trial. In the second ripple effect, I look at the impact of the experimental intervention on the parents of the young truants. The ripple effects, however, go even wider than the impact on the young truants and their families. The third ripple effect I propose is the impact of the intervention on the teachers and police involved in the trial. And finally, I'm going to comment on a fourth ripple effect. This is the ripple effect that, that, of change that comes when organisations have the courage to test under randomised field trial conditions new and innovative ways to control and prevent crime problems. So, I hope you all recognise these people. This is a picture of Ron Clark and Derek Cornish that was taken, we think, in 1982, so it's a little bit after the Kingswood trial. And I think you'll all agree that they're very handsome young men. I think Derek's here and, and Ron is somewhere. Uh, there he is. So, um, and I re my thanks go to, sh to Ron's wife, Sheila, who I know hunted high and low for a picture of uh, Ron and, and Derek together. I don't think they wanted to be photographed too much back in those days. So they conducted the Kingswood Training School experiment in the UK from August 1965 until October 1969. So I'm just going to take a few moments to just orientate people to this trial because I think it has some um, real lessons for uh, the ripple effects to today. So this is the Kingswood Training School that uh, at the time uh, Derek said there was no trees, so, uh, it was just tarmac. Uh, and during the 1960s, the training school was a residential institution where young boys were sent under court order, usually for committing offences, but sometimes because they were deemed beyond, the, beyond parental control. The trial included 280 boys allocated to one of three residential houses. One of the houses was for boys deemed ineligible or otherwise unsuitable for the intervention. The rest of the boys were randomly allocated to either the control house or the experimental house. 
The control house involved the approved business as usual school approach to handling the institutionalised boys, which involved adult directed interventions. The experimental house implemented a therapeutic community, which compared to the business as usual approach was considered more permissive and included a system of sharing responsibilities amongst staff and boys. So in reading the papers and reports coming out of the Kingswood trial, the litany of problems reads like a Cook and Campbell uh, list of all the threats to internal and external validity in experimentation, including significant implementation problems. Unsurprisingly, the results showed virtually no differences between the experimental and control groups in terms of reconviction rates, both at two years and ten years post-randomisation. The results also showed persistent offending um, within the sample. So despite the failure of the Kingswood trial, I think the Kingswood trial, in concert with Ron's absconding study that you heard yesterday that was conducted about the same time, were pebbles in the ocean that set forth a series of ripple effects. So first, I think it's fair to say, and Ron, correct me if I'm wrong here, that these early research experiences propelled Ron's career to take a sharp right-hand turn away from experimentation, even though he was a trained experimental uh, psychologist. Second, Derek Cornish summed up the Kingswood problems as being more than just a failure of the practice of, of experimentation, but also a failure of theory. David Weisberg has quoted Ron as saying that the experiment might have been able to say what happened, but it could not answer how or why. So observations about the resounding theory failure in both the absconding and the Kingswood trial set forth more than four decades of ripple effects. It led for, to a hunt for better theoretical solutions to crime problems, which ultimately led to the articulation of situational crime prevention, pioneered, as we all know, by our Stockholm Prize winners in 2015, Ron Clark and Pat Mayhew. But the failure of the Kingswood trial and other therapeutic trials during the 1960s also gave criminal justice agencies reasons to resist and oppose experimental evaluations. So I now just want to dwell on this last point just for a few moments. Okay, so if we fast forward to 2015, I think it's fair to say that experimentation is well and truly alive, at least in the policing arena, of which I'm most familiar. So this is a graph showing the exponential growth in the number of RCT randomised control trials and quasi-experimental police evaluations from 1950 to now. So we produced this graph using information collected from the global policing database that we call the GPD. Creating the GPD has been a collaborative project over the last few years between my team at the University of Queensland, particularly my colleagues here today, Angela Higginson and Liz, who are sitting down the front here, and our partners in the UK, particularly the Policing College and Betsy Stanko at the London Lord Mayor's Office. We've used systematic review techniques covering a massive 88 academic databases, 89 grey literature sources, 20 hand search uh, sources and 48 language other than English sources of, of information. To give us the broadest possible reach, our eligibility criteria allowed a wide range of policing interventions and outcome measures. The graph shows the raw search results in five year increments since 1950. In total, we have identified and retrieved over 350,000 abstracts, which is shown in five year increments in the blue bars. Um, the red line shows the increase in provisional eligibility after stage one screening, and the green line, which is all the way at the bottom there, which I, I've purposely not rescaled. Um, to show our final eligibility projections. So the first take home message from this is that the green line at the bottom uh, shows that there's a huge undertaking to sift through an enormous amount of information to remove ineligible cases and to finalise the global policing database. So in real numbers, it shows that by mid-2014, we've recorded and identified 7,440 
uh, policing experiments and quasi-experiments ever conducted in the world. That's a lot of, many more experiments than we thought. So when we look specifically at the number of fully randomised controlled field trials that seek to reduce crime, that just have crime and uh, disorder outcomes, the pool of experiments is a lot smaller than that 7,440 that we've identified that covers a much broader range of policing interventions from HR issues to occupational health to, um, to management to leadership, etc. So Peter Nehrud maintains a private registry, thank you Peter, of uh, policing RCTs. And the George Mason Lum Copa matrix have been used to generate this graph. The graph shows the number of fully randomised field trials with crime and disorder outcomes. It mirrors the exponential growth in experimentation starting in the 1990s that I think we would all agree Larry Sherman and David Weisberg was the prime movers and shakers of experimentation and the escalation of experimentation throughout the world. So right now in 2015, we know that there are at least 101 finalised policing RCTs with crime and disorder outcomes and at least 19 in-flight trials. So the ability truancy trial that I'm going to be talking about today is one of those 19 in-flight experiments. The trial is both a theoretical and practical test of third-party policing that takes heed of the lessons learned from the theory and practice failures of the Kingswood and absconding studies that frustrated Ron during the late 1960s. So I'll now turn to the ability trial to consider four specific ripple effects of experimentation. Okay, so we know that policing is a tough business. We know that there are things the police can do to be to be effective, but in my view there's also a lot more that the police could do to set forth ripple effects of change. So today I'm going to talk um, about why I think partnerships offer some promise for policing in the future. The first ripple effect where, uh, is where I look directly at the impact of the ability truancy trial on the young people in the study. In the second ripple effect, I'll talk about the impact of the intervention on the parents of the truants. Then I'm going to present some data on the ripple effects of the trial on the teachers and police who were part of the partnership in the trial. And finally, finally I'll comment on the ripple effects of change that comes when police organisations use randomised field trial conditions to test new and innovative ways to control and prevent crime problems. These ripples, I will argue, embody the energy and daring that Robert Kennedy described in his Ripple of Hope speech some 49 years ago. So the central idea of third party policing is that police need partners to sustain their crime control gains. They simply cannot bring about long term change by themselves. The Ability Truancy Trial is a randomised experiment that tests the theoretical tenets and impact of third party policing on reducing truancy and crime problems associated with the families with truanting youth. In third party policing, the police partner with other organisations or agencies to collaboratively reduce crime and disorder problems. The key defining features of third party policing is the partnership and the third party's legal lever. So the two-part third party policing intervention is contrasted with the general policing approach, which involves the police wor working alone to directly target crime and disorder problems. So in the Ability Truancy Trial, we carefully operationalise the two critical components of third party policing. So the left arrow at the top represents the first component of the ability trial, namely a partnership between the Queensland Police and 11 target schools. The right arrow at the top represents the legal lever component of third party policing. In the ability trial, the legal lever was the truancy laws that hold parents responsible for their child's attendance at school. The business as usual condition involved the police using cautions, street checks and arrests to address the problems caused by truanting young people. 
So the genesis of the ability truancy trial began when a local police superintendent expressed concerns about truancy in her police district. She lamented the overrepresentation of truanting young people in the district's crime statistics and the lack of police rapport with schools in the area. One of the local print school principals recalled that prior to the start of ability, police were pelted with tomatoes and lunchbox leftovers as they walked through the school grounds. In late 2009, police in this particular school district decided to build a partnership with the schools to help them better target the problem of truanting young people in their area. The police recognised that the schools were a vital partner with legislative responsibility to address truancy problems. So the police reached out to the local school principals in an effort to work together to address the truancy problems in their district. So the truancy legislation in Queensland, and I'm not sure how, how it looks in other parts of the world, um, is very explicit about the escalation processes for school non-attendance. So if we align the truancy laws in Queensland to the Ayers and Braithwaite regulatory pyramid, this slide shows how the laws are activated in four stages. So first, at the bottom of the pyramid, a warning letter is sent to the parent or guardian of the truanting young people explaining the parental responsibilities for making sure their child attends school. So if the, the child still fails to attend school, the second step is a formal meeting initiated by the principal to talk to the parents about their responsibilities. If the child continues to truant, um, the third step requires that the principal issues a notice to, to the parent to warn the parent that they are being recommended for prosecution. Finally, for those cases where the truanting problem is unresolved, the Chief Executive of the Department of Education and Training initiates prosecution against the parent. The maximum penalty for the first offence is $600, and for the second or subsequent offence, the penalty is $1,200. So in the Ability Truancy Trial, the business as usual intervention left the police to, the, to use their normal approaches for dealing with truants, which included street checks, warnings, formal cautions and arrests. The business as usual condition also left the schools to use their legal levers in their usual way as well. In practice, it was up to the school principal to escalate cases through the regulatory pyramid as they saw fit. For the control cases, formal meetings between the parent or guardian and the principal would occur in the principal's office and both warning letters and letters of impending prosecution were sent via snail mail to the parents of the truanting young people. So in the experimental arm of the ability trial, the police sought to reduce truanting problems by working, collaborative, working with the schools in a way that tried to convince the parents and guardians to willingly comply with the law. Putting the theory of third party policing into practice, we operationalised the intervention to involve a facilitated family group conference that both demonstrated the partnership between the police and schools and clearly communicated the legal responsibilities of the parents to get their children to attend school. So this is a photo of the Ability Family Group Conference, which starkly contrasts to the way cases were dealt with in the control arm of the trial. A trained facilitator from the Department of Community Services managed the conferences, which were held at a location that was comfortable for the families. The conferences were child-focused, and held sometimes at the school, but often at a community centre or other neutral places. The content and flow of the Ability Family Group Conference was especially designed and structured to mobilise the key theoretical component parts of third party policing. So first, the partnership between police and schools was demonstrated by having both a uniformed police officer and a school representative actively participating and explaining to the young person and their parent the effect of truancy on their work and conveying their sincere desire for the young person to regularly attend school. So second, 
the school representative explained the legal requirements of parents to have their child attend school, specifying that they could be fined and possibly prosecuted for their child's non-attendance. So facilitators in the experimental arm prompted the school representatives to articulate these legal levers at appropriate times during the conference with the goal to get the, both the parents and the children to willingly comply with the school attendance laws. Child focus action plans were developed cooperatively during the conferences and then monitored by the police. Okay, so this is a picture of my UQ team members. So the ability trial has been a major undertaking for police, schools and my research team over the last five years. So I just wanted to pause for a few moments now and just acknowledge the work of my University of Queensland team members. In particular, I want to acknowledge Sarah Bennett, Emma Antrobus and Liz Eggins and my PhD students. I also want to publicly acknowledge the support from the Queensland Police Service and the Department of Education and Training and the Department of Community Services. Okay, in terms of the trial, we ran a pilot test of the ability intervention and processes during 2010. We launched the trial in October 2011 and by May 2013 we'd recruited all eligible uh, cases. The young people had to be aged between 10 and 16 years of age with 85% or less attendance in three previous school terms and their, their attendance was counted based on them having their, their absences having no legitimate excuse for, um, uh, for not attending school. The ethics process dictated that the schools called the parents or guardians in the first instance to ask if they'd be willing to participate in the trial. Upon consent, students and their families were randomly assigned to either the control group, called the resource group, or the engagement group, which received the experimental intervention. The ability to trial was powered to include 102 truanting young people and their responsible guardians from the 11 participating schools. Over the recruitment period, 51 young people were randomly allocated to the experimental condition, 51 to the control condition. At baseline, the simple randomisation allocation process led to a high degree of equivalence. We know that 91% of the children had had prior police contact, and at baseline measurement, uh, we, we observed no significant differences between the two groups on levels of truancy, offending and key demographic characteristics. So, the first ripple effect that I'll explore today is the direct impact of the Ability Truancy trial on the 102 young people recruited to the trial. From the outset, we hypothesised several direct effects. We proposed that the partnership would increase the willingness of young people to attend school, reduce antisocial behaviour, increase satisfaction with school, increase the willingness to cooperate with police, increase perceptions of school and police legitimacy, increase self-efficacy and reduce emotional problems. We also set up the trial to test the long-term effects of the partnership, hypothesising that the police need partners to sustain their crime control gains. So, when we look at the impact, uh, the official uh, school attendance data, we find statistically significant differences between the control and the experimental groups. So this chart shows the results of a survival analysis that assesses the number of days that it takes for two groups to fail in their efforts to attend school post-randomisation. The control group is represented in the blue lines and had a lower mean time to failure than the experimental group that's represented in the red lines. In real days, the control group young people took a mean of 4.5 days to fail, whereas the experimental group young people took a mean of 8.2 days to fail in terms of their first absence from school post-randomisation. When we look at the face-to-face -face survey data collected at 12 weeks post-randomisation, we find some supporting results. This is a graph summarising the young people's views at 12 weeks post-randomisation. 
The left blue bar is the mean attitudes on a five-point scale for the control group, and the red right bar is the mean for the experimental group. The stars depict significant t-test differences at 12 weeks post uh, between the experimental and control conditions. So as this graph shows, at 12 weeks post randomization the experimental young people say that they have tried to go to school more often relative to the control young people. We also find statistically significant differences at 12 weeks post randomization in relation to the way ability, the ability intervention made the experimental young people address the reasons why they were skipping school. The control and experimental groups were not different in terms of how useful they thought the police and schools were in helping them improve their behaviour. So this graph summarises the same question asked again of the ability young people at six months post-randomisation. As this graph shows the statistically significant differences between the experimental and control young people saying that they've tried to go to school more often holds at six months post-randomisation. Similarly, at the six-month mark, we again find differences between the experimental and control young people in relation to the way the respective interventions made them the address the reasons why they were skipping school, favouring the experimental condition. We also find that at the six-month mark, the experimental young people say the family group conference approach made them improve their behaviour. So my team at the University of Queensland is also collecting one-year, two-year and eventually five-year follow-up data. Our goal, as I've said before, is to see the long-term effects of the third-party policing partnership. So we've also examined the official police data for the trial participants, focusing on all actioned recorded offences, including arrests, cautions, warrant and warrant records, showing, and we show here some promising results. So we find that the experimental group have fewer offences in the post-randomisation period than the control group, and our t-test difference of means shows statistically significant differences between the experimental control group when we examine the mean number of days to re-offend post-randomisation. So this again is a graph of the survival time to failure analysis, showing the differences between the two groups that favour the experimental group. The control group again is represented in the blue line and had a quicker mean time to failure than the experimental group represented by the red line. The mean days to, to fail post-randomisation for the control group was 753 days and it was 834 days for the experimental group. This means that the experimental group were charged or arrested faster than participants in the experimental group in the exposure period post-randomisation. So examining the self-reports about pro-social behaviour provides a flip side view of offending behaviour. This is a graph showing the results of a mixed model ANOVA analysing the parents' views of their child's pro-social behaviour from the survey data from baseline to six months post-randomisation. In this analysis, the between groups comparison is the condition, the within groups comparison is time, um, uh, and we include a condition by time interaction. The significant interaction is graphed on the, si on the slide. The experimental group represents, uh, are represented by the red line and the control group by the blue line. So what this shows is that baseline there were no statistically significant differences between the two groups, despite the graph showing that the experimental group had lower self-reported pro-social behaviour than the control group. But the graph also shows that the parents in the experimental group reported their child showed significant improvement in pro-social behaviour at six months follow-up compared to baseline. By contrast, we show no significant change in the parents' perceptions of their child's pro-social behaviour in the control group. When we explore the effects of the trial on emotional wellbeing, we find some more promising results. 
As expected, we find no statistically significant differences in emotional wellbeing between the two groups at baseline prior to random allocation. Then using a mixed model ANOVA to test the impact of the intervention on self-reported emotional difficulties, we find a significant interaction where the parents in the experimental group report significantly less emotional difficulties in their children at the six-month follow-up compared to baseline. There were no significant changes in parents' reports of their child's emotional well difficulties in the control group. Okay, turning now to the ripple effect of the trial on the parents, recall that the ability intervention involved two main mechanisms of change, a partnership between police and schools and communication to the parents and guardians about their legal responsibilities for getting their children to attend school. So this is a clip from a local newspaper where the parent, who's not a parent that was part of our trial, uh, was actually prosecuted for breach of the Department of Education and Training truancy laws. The gist of this newspaper story is that the parent felt she was unfairly treated by the schools in getting prosecuted for her daughter not going to school. The experimental arm of the ability trial attempted to avoid this type of situation. In short, the goal was to educate the parents about their legal obli obligations and get the parents and young people to willingly comply with the law and not risk prosecution. So when we look at the ripple effect of the ability trial on the parents, we find some interesting results. As with the earlier graphs, the experimental group is depicted in red and the control group is depicted in blue. At baseline, we find no statistically significant differences in parents' attitudes to the truancy laws and perceptions of prosecution likelihood. The graph shows, however, that the parents and guardians in the experimental condition showed a significant increase from baseline to 12 weeks post-randomisation in their perceptions of prosecution likelihood if their child did not go to school. So put another way, we find that the experimental intervention made the parents and guardians aware of their legal responsibilities for getting their children to attend school. So we also hypothesised that there would be a moderating ripple effect of the ability trial where we expected the family group conference to raise parental awareness of their legal responsibilities which would make the parents more willing to, willing to comply with the laws, which would then increase the likelihood of young people attending school. Recall that we've established a child effect around self-reported efforts to attend school more often both at 12 weeks and six months post-randomisation. So in this graph, we assess whether or not this effect is moderated by parents' attitudes towards prosecution for their child's truanting behaviour. So the graph shows that the experimental intervention increased a young person's efforts to go to school when the parents and or guardians believed that prosecution for non-attendance was likely. So the third ripple effect that I want to talk about today is the impact of the truancy trial on the partnerships between the police and school staff. Recall that the ability trial was undertaken because the police were being pelted with tomatoes and leftover lunches when they walked through the school gates. At the heart of the ability trial was the explicit partnership between the schools and the police to work together to reduce the, both the direct and run-on effects of truancy problems. These partnerships are often assumed, they're expected and they're encouraged but we, gen we generally neglect to understand precisely how these partnerships function, if they function at all. So for the experimental condition only, we surveyed the police and school representatives who took part in the experimental arm of the trial uh, immediately post the family group conference. When we look at the factors driving the partnership between the schools and the police, we find the following. First, we find no differences in the school and police representatives who participated in the experimental arm of the trial in their ratings of each other regarding the frequency, 
timeliness or accuracy of communication about the student's truancy. So put another way, the trial seems to generate shared views between the police and schools in the way they communicate with each other, which is a good thing. But we also find that the school representatives have significantly more positive views about the police in terms of collaboration, shared knowledge, mutual respect and shared goals than how the police feel about the schools. The police, it seems, are a little more cynical about collaboration with the schools than the schools of police. So different partner perceptions of the truancy uh, law legitimacy is what we think driving some of the tensions between the, the school and police participants in the ability trial. Anecdotally, some of the school representatives told us that they felt the truancy laws were draconian and not worth pursuing and they didn't really like them very much. When we use a t-test to assess the effect of role on perceptions of law legitimacy, we find that the police respondents had significantly higher perceptions of legitimacy of the truancy laws than the school representatives. This is depicted by the star between the blue bar representing the police and the red bar representing the schools. So for me, this is actually a really interesting finding. So recall that the experimental policing, uh, third party policing intervention sought from the outset to get the school representatives to communicate the legal consequences of truanting during the family group conference. The goal was to get the parents to willingly comply with the laws and make every reasonable attempt to get their children back to school. Our results suggest, however, that the school bureaucrats often don't buy the legitimacy of the truancy laws. Yet, in the facilitated family group conference, the school representatives were asked to explain the truancy laws to the parents, regardless of whether or not they agreed with the laws. We think that the uh, family group conference created some informal social control around the school street bureaucrats. So given that we find that the experimental young people are making a greater effort than the control group young people to attend school, we think that the simple communication of truancy laws in a non-threatening set setting is a simple yet critical ingredient to make a, a ripple effect difference in the lives of young people. So there's one last ripple effect that my team at the University of Queensland is exploring, and that's the organisational learning that comes from police leading and being part of field trials like the Ability Trial. My PhD student, Laura Bedford, describes the organisational learning process from RCTs like a series of COGS. The diagram here illustrates the broad theoretical relationship she's testing between RCTs and organisational learning. So the purple COG represents the ripple effects of RCTs on generating new knowledge. If, and that's a big if, the new knowledge generated from the RCTs is disseminated through the organisation, then it's theorised to activate a process of knowledge interpretation, which is represented by the blue cog. The green cog represents the outcome of actual and measurable change and organisational behaviour. The idea of the multiple cogs is to illustrate that the relationship between new knowledge and organisational learning is moderated uh, by a non-linear and uncertain process of organisational learning, that the learning by doing is a critical component here. But the cogs heuristic is also quite appropriate to police experimentation, suggesting that there are multiple opportunities to have the metaphorical spanner interrupting the organisational learning process. The spanner in the COG representation is therefore metaphorical for the uncertainty and variability in the ripple effect impact of RCTs on organisational learning. So working closely for a number of years with the Queensland Police Service, we see a wide range of these spanners that block the process of organisational change. But we also see a large number of reform initiatives. For example, the Queensland Police now initiate and run a number of experiments on a range of operational issues. 
They've also introduced evidence-based policing lectures and workshops into recruit and management training. And it was the Queensland Police who launched the Australian and New Zealand chapter of the Society of Evidence-Based Policing started in the UK. <clears throat> so in conclusion, <clears throat> I started off this lecture today talking about the ripple effects of experiments, how one experiment can change the lives of many. I wanted to highlight how experimentation, with all its warts and flaws, often embody the energy and daring that Robert Kennedy described 49 years ago in his Ripple of Hope speech. So turning now to the Dalai Lama, I've just turned 50, maybe this is why I'm getting all spiritual. <laughs> just as ripples spread out when a single pebble is dropped into the water, the actions of individuals can have far-reaching effects. So using this ripple effect theme, I started today's lecture by revisiting the ripple effect of Ron's early work, particularly the Kingswood Training School experiment. I then talked about the escalation of police experiments, particularly since the mid-1990s. I then used some of the promising results from the ability truancy trial to show four specific ripple effects. First, I showed some direct and positive effects of the third-party policing partnerships on the efforts of truanting young people to attend school. Second, I showed changes in the attitudes and perceptions of parents that flow to help the young people get back to school. Third, I showed how the ripple effect reaches to the street level bureaucrats with teachers and parents being willing to uh, cooperate but with different perceptions of legitimacy of truancy laws. Forging these partnerships we propose will help bring about long term gains. And finally, I talked about the reverberating effect of doing experiments on the organisational learning capacity of police agencies. So it's possible that the escalation of police experiments in recent years, like the ability trial, is indicative of a tide change and emerging appetite amongst police for using experiments to try new and innovative ways to control crime and disorder problems. But there's one last ripple effect that is a lot more personal, at least to me. It's not often that a scholar can say that they've had two amazing PhD mentors. In my case, most people are aware that the 2010 Stockholm Prize winner, Professor David Weisberg, was a chair of my PhD committee in the early 1990s. What might be a little less known is that Ron met me in 1988 in Australia and brought me to Rutgers to do my PhD. I know that I'm just one person who is part of the ripple effects of Ron's influence. Many others are in this room today. Ron's work is an inspiration to me and I think it's true to say that the ripple effects of Ron's legacy reverberate far and wide across the globe and have for many years. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us for a wonderful tribute to Ron Clark, uh, as well as an outstanding contribution to experimental criminology. Once again, thank you. Professor Lorraine Mazzarol. Uh, we, we do have a few minutes, and uh, uh, our lecturer is happy to take any questions that uh, anyone might like to um, pose without the aid of a microphone, um, or do we have the aid of a microphone? Uh, so in any case, um, are there any questions? Well, uh, if not, um, you may uh, have a question from the back here. Uh, Dr. Kate Painter is uh, rising and the microphone is on the way, Kate. You talked about uh, consent of the parents to participate in the experiment as controls or getting the experimental treatment. 
How, what was the refusal rate of parents who said no? And are they likely to be the more antisocial parents? Sure. Uh, yes, we do have all the data on those that uh, we um, were eligible that, that, and didn't convert into the experiment. So we are exploring whether there's any differences in terms of uh, those, that population. So I don't have that here with me right now, but yes, we're looking at that. Dr. Strang is uh, over on this side. If you can get the mic, uh, raise your hand here. <clears throat> I was, I was interested in whether there were enough um, participants to do any subgroup analysis because I was wondering actually whether there were any uh, social or particularly race effects um, in, yeah. in your findings. I mean, we, we can look at the subgroups, but it's not powered enough to, to do that, Heather. It's a very small trial, and I should say that this was a m major effort for the police and the schools to sustain this trial and the, there was absolutely no way that they were going over um, over the 100 mark we were able to uh, to get it to 102 so that is just not sufficiently powered to do that properly. Other questions? If not, once again, thank you very much for coming and we hope to uh, see you next week.